Okay, you're ready, Paul. Okay, well, thanks everybody for joining us. My name is Paul Albritton. I am uh, with the Iowa LTAP and a member of the professional work group and uh, the work group committee. And it was my turn to uh, coordinate the next Lunch and Learn. And so anyway, I reached out to some of the LTAPs and they graciously agreed to do this. And my thanks to Montana LTAP, Michigan and Indiana uh, for accepting the challenge and uh, putting up with me for this last week and a half. I've sent them the wrong links at different times and things like that. And so they've been really great to work with. Um, also, thanks for Kim and uh, Mary's not on, but also uh, Victoria out in Ohio for hosting this. Uh, does a fantastic job with that. So Victoria, you wanted to mention the question box. Yes, if um, everybody who is an attendee could please look in your GoToWebinar panel and find the question box. And then if you wouldn't mind, just drop me a hi or hello in there just so I know that you know where it's at. Um, this is how we'll be taking questions from everybody during the presentations. Um, and then I'll be reading those questions off to the presenters at the end of their presentations. So I got three highs so far and Mary's on here, so that's great. Okay, make sure everybody else drops me a higher hello too. Thank you. Back to you, Paul. Okay, so can everybody see, are we looking at the Iowa Local Technical Assistance Program website? Yes, that's that visible program? on the screen. So what was happening, kind of give you a little backstory. Um, this was a website redevelopment a couple of years ago. And, but it seemed that every time that our county engineers would get together, worker safety training was always on the agenda and this is something that they've struggled with for a long time typically for them what would happen is somebody would send them a dvd it would maybe uh, our ltap would do that or somebody else they watch it the guys sign a piece of paper and then they go back to work and that was their idea of safety training and that works very well until something happens and then they would find out like if there was an accident that happened that OSHA would come in and all of a sudden your training is inadequate. And as one of the engineers told me, you know, it has to be more than just watching DVDs. And there is a lot more to it than that. And so I started wondering really with our website and how it was designed. And I was kind of in on the ground floor, um, developing some web pages and doing some troubleshooting and things like that, that was there something that we could do to help uh, be the catalyst for that? And all I knew is that it had to be online. Uh, it, it couldn't be this sending out the DVDs all the time, uh, but it had to be complete, uh, had to be easy to use, and it had to be compliant. And so what I thought I would show you is what we came up with. We actually rolled this out at our engineers conference in December. And so it's only you know five or six months old, but under the worker safety training, uh, we have a resource tab for that. And what I ask of them is just to fill this little form out. It's just to name your organization and an email address. This is for our Iowa County Secondary Roads Public Works departments, not for consultants, not for uh, contractors, people like that. And so once they fill this out and they just hit continue, there's a couple of things that happen. Uh, one is, is that I'll get a notification email letting me know that they're in there. Uh, but the other thing that it does for them is for our customer, it takes them to the next page. And so hopefully that's showing here uh, 2020 safety resources at the top and safety training resources for public agencies. This first paragraph is kind of a disclaimer. Uh, you'll see things like serves as a starting point. Um, provided as a guide, you may need to make adjustments and all that. Basically, it just says that I'm not responsible for any of this. This is going to be on you ultimately, uh, and you can visit OSHA for that. And then I gave them some instructions on what they need to do. Um, and you'll see the safety training modules that we came up with. Uh, there's actually 24 safety training modules that are listed. And if you go back up to the instructions, it just says print the applicable subpart of the standard, which is I've included that in the modules and then highlight the portions that apply to your organization. Nobody expects you to train the things that you don't do or don't apply. And the bloodborne pathogen standard is a great example of that because our secondary roads departments are not spinning things around in a centrifuge. They're not taking plasma or at a blood donation center or anything like that. 
uh, basically, if somebody cuts their hand at the welding table and leaves a blood trail for the first aid kit, you know, really what we need to know is how are you going to keep people out of that? How are you going to clean it up? And how are you going to dispose of it? That's the main part of the standard uh, for us in secondary roads. And so train to the parts of the standard that apply to you. Don't worry about the rest of it. Uh, preview the safety training video. Uh, pay attention to the points that you want to emphasize there. Uh, review the structure, instructor materials, uh, the OSHA training requirements. Uh, print and use fact sheets or tailgate talks, and then you present these materials at your safety meeting. Uh, after that, collect the sign-in sheets, document the meeting, and the subjects covered. And so to give you, I thought we would just run through one of these, just a quick cursory glance to show you how this works. Um, we'll just choose excavation safety, but they all look and feel the same. Every one of these modules, the same kind of order. So the first thing that somebody would come to is just a summary of the standard. Uh, you see the competent person is listed there. He has some specific responsibilities when it comes to excavations and trenching, uh, soil classification, uh, employers, what they can do to prevent cave-ins, and then some other information. Once they get through the, the summary of it, which you could make a safety training just on that, if you remember, I said print the subpart that applied, print the subpart for the standard. And I've separated all of these out. And so this thing is 13 pages long. When you think about it, that's six and a half pages front and back. Take 20 minutes to read through it, highlight the parts that apply to you, and then don't worry about the rest of it. I've separated out all of the appendices that go with these. You can see those listed there. So if you don't really, if you want to know, you know, the, what OSHA says about timber shoring for trenches, you can just click on that particular thing. Um, as far as the video goes, this will take you off-site to our vendor. <clears throat> you can see the, the Iowa LTAP logo up here. Um, with this vendor, we buy video views in bulk, and this they're streaming videos, so we have access to their entire library. Uh, they have three to 400 uh, safety training videos that are there. And so for our safety modules, I picked out the 23 or 24 most recent, most relevant uh, videos that we could for each one of those modules. And so you can see this particular video is 22 minutes long. Um, I told them on the front end, preview the video. So if you're the one that's conducting the safety meeting, you go into preview mode, it's the lower quality, faster loading, not to be used for training. Uh, if you're going to do the training video, then you would do English or Spanish, whatever, whatever applies to you. And then also that's available to them, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, are quizzes if you wanted to do something like that, you know, a, a training log or that's more like a sign-in sheet, um, answers to the quizzes. You could even print certificates from here. And so there's no login. Go straight, straight to the... Um, the videos themselves. The instructor guide is there. If OSHA says that there's a written safety plan that goes with this particular part, this standard, I've included those safety plans there. And those are actually just a fill in the blank. I mean, it's it's literally your name here type of, of plan. And so everything else is written out. It's a Word document. You can edit that. Uh, you can change it to fit your organization. but but that's there. Um, here's some fact sheets. Uh, this is one uh, that'll come up. And this is just a front and back little fact sheet. Put it on the bulletin board, uh, put it on the break room tables. A trenching checklist. Uh, if OSHA had a dedicated website for a particular topic, this one they do, uh, it's on their national emphasis program. And it's also regional and state emphasis here, at least in Iowa. Um, slope it, shore it, shield it website, and, and there's just more information that they can get to there. And then also, uh, you may recognize some of these, but um, tailgate talks. And so where I find our national LTAP, we've got those tailgate talks where I find a fit for those in there. I actually include those in. <clears throat> and so the point being is if we go back to the instructions, uh, you've printed the standard, you've trained to those those things that apply to you. Uh, the video, you went through the fact sheet, you've gone through all of this, you collect your sign-in sheet, you three-hole punch it or put it in a filing cabinet, and we're done. 
I mean, this is, it has been easy, it's complete, it's compliant. Uh, if OSHA ever came in to, to ask what you trained on, you could show them the file or you can bring them to this website. The, the good thing about this for me is that this is nothing that I came up with. I mean, this is really cut and paste for their own, from their own website. I mean, it's downloading their PDFs, it's in their language. Uh, it's not my opinion. One thing about this excavation safety one is that this is not meant to be a substitute for uh, an all day class where we cover the responsibilities of a competent person. Uh, it's not that, but this is the awareness training that uh, that you would need to do if you have workers that are um, working in trenches or, or or excavations. And so it's more of that awareness training. Um, a couple of other things in the next few seconds that I have uh, that I wanted to show you that I included was a uh, ocean record keeping training from management. And this is something that our counties are having difficulty with. And it's not just secondary roads, it, it's all levels of the county government because they report as a county, not as secondary roads or sheriffs or conservation, but they report as a whole. And so the question of what do we report? What do we record? Who puts all these things together? All of that training is there. And there's videos, there's tutorials, there's links to the forms and all of the instructions that they would need for that. And then one other one that I would highlight before I close out is safety and health program information and training. And this is um, a module where if you wanted to start a safety program or if um, you want to start a safety committee or something like that, all of that information is there, including videos and uh, booklets and things. Uh, the other thing that I have in there is a general industry checklist. So it's like you just, it's a shop walkthrough checklist. So are your exits marked? Uh, are they are they clear? You know, uh, are there fire extinguishers mounted? Are they easily accessible? Things like that. And just go through once a month and play OSHA inspector and go through your facility. So all of these things, the, the newest one that I added really was heat illness. We haven't had to deal with that in Iowa so far this year, but uh, we had frost warnings last weekend. So, um, but heat illness is the, the latest one that I put in there. So other than that, that's about, <clears throat> I thought I would share that with you. That's that's one of the things that's really helped us. I also have noticed in the last couple of months where we've had more people going into that site than, uh, than we have in the past. So I think as some new employees come on, uh, they're going through it, training with them, and then also as just really gearing up for some safety training classes that are coming up. So anyway, with that, I mean, I don't know if there's any questions out there, Victoria, but if not, I will turn it back over to you. We do have one question. It's from Rusty Lee, and he'd like to know what the source is for the videos. Um, the source for the videos is we do Atlantic training, and then it went, their online, their streaming training was used to be called WAVE, uh, W-A-V-E, uh, and now I think they're called Safety Soft or something like that. But if you went to Atlantic Safety Training, I can't remember where they're based out of, but um, but they can but they can hook you up with that. Okay, I don't good, see good any... to work for. Good good to work with. Um, they've been great. I mean, they've been spot on anything that we've asked them to do. No other questions in the box right now. So I believe Sean is the next person, correct? Yes. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and move things over for Shauna to be our presenter. And again, any questions you have, please put them in the box while Shauna's speaking, and I'll read those to her at the end. Shauna, I've sent the, I believe I sent the make you a presenter. You'll have to accept yes, it. Yes, you did. There we go. All right. Yes, you did. So I am Shauna Page from Montana LTAP, and I am the professional trainer um, here in Montana. And I travel around, as we all do, travel around and do various training. And one of the things that um, I'm going to talk about today is a couple um, trainings that we do that is a kind of significant in Montana. I know that some of the LTAPs are. Um, teaching these classes as well, but 
Um, having this in-house is relatively unique to Montana. Uh, we also have the opportunity to go, or I had the opportunity to go to North Dakota um, last year to help with some of their LTAP program delivering. And um, these classes were included, or, or the OSHA 10 um, class was included in that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about OSHA and OSHA 10 and OSHA 30 first. Um, and who needs OSHA and who um, is significant? Who would it be relevant for? Uh, most workers in construction, the building development and other related fields, um, they need to take the OSHA outreach training. Um, this will ensure that workers are able to identify, uh, predict, prevent, and stop potential hazards uh, within your workplace. Montana LTAP is currently offering these trainings on a demand request um, basis. The OSHA 30 is much more in depth uh, in, in each subject that is taught uh, than the OSHA 10 class and would be more for supervisors or um, uh, leaders, the lead workers. In each of the trainings, we must follow the guidelines through OSHA. We have to follow OSHA's guidelines. And so we can't teach more than seven hours a day. And this means that the OSHA 10 is a day and a half and the OSHA 30 breaks down into seven days. And we have to subtract our lunches and our um, break times out of that. Uh, so that's one of the one of the things that people um, ask about that with the OSHA 10 and the OSHA 30. And one of our challenges that we face in this country, um, in our uh, state, is workers not being covered by OSHA. So they don't think that the OSHA regulations apply directly to them. However, they do apply, um, at least in Montana, the Department of Labor is who oversees our counties and cities. Um, and so they go directly off of the OSHA regulations. So if you're following those OSHA regulations, you are then in turn following the Department of Labor. And they are in Montana, they are starting to do inspections in the county shops. And that has significantly increased their awareness and encouraging them to want to take the training. So that has helped um, us quite a bit with that. Some of the subjects that are taught in the OSHA 10, there are certain subjects that we have to teach. Uh, we have to teach the health hazards and the uh, OSHA construction focus for, we have to go over fall protection, electric, electricity safety, uh, PPE, um, OSHA supporter for worker rights. And these subjects all have to be gone over, but then there's other subjects that are that I try to pinpoint uh, to your significant needs or your specific needs. So like, for example, construction um, or confined space, um, trenching and excavating, and those kind of things. And we do those for people, especially city workers are really interested in the confined space and they need that training. And then the trenching and excavating for the counties who are doing um, culverts, for example. So uh, we, can, we can direct it towards their needs and that really helps. Another class that we teach, um, and I do quite a few, especially refreshers of these, but um, MSHA, MSHA, which is Mine Safety and Health Administration, and we teach uh, just the part 46. There's different parts for MSHA, and it depends on what you, where you're working. So the part 46 applies to miners engaged in um, surface mining, sand and gravel, uh, surface stone, that kind of thing. And so that makes it so if they have a sand and gravel pit, they are going to need MSHA uh, 46. And anybody that goes on or enters that mine site has to have this training or a part of it. So uh, say you have truck drivers that come in, they have to have hazard specific training. So a lot of this training uh, we offer to our counties and I do 
refreshers probably five or six a year. Um, and that has increased every year that I've been doing it. And 20, about two thirds of our counties have a crusher. So it's pretty significant training for the counties. Um, and they, what they have to do is they have to take a 24 hour initial training and then they have to take an eight hour annual refresher. So it's, it's every year that these people have to be, um, have to be trained. Uh, we offer this training at a very low cost to our counties. And so that is helpful to them. There is contractors that provide this training as well, but um, that are outside of the LTAPs, but they're at a much higher cost. So some of the things that we um, cover in this, um, it's an introduction to the work environment. It, it includes a visit and tour of the mine. And this is the initial training um, or portions of the mine uh, that are specific to where they're going to be working, uh, the method of mining or operating operations that's going to be uh, they're going to be involved in, and then recognition and avoidance of hazards such as electrical hazards or other hazards that might be uh, present at a mine, like traffic patterns and controlling uh, mobile equipment like haul trucks and such. Uh, loose, unstable ground is another thing that we go over. Uh, we review the emergency medical procedures, um, like an escape route or the evacuation plans, uh, anything that is in effect at the mine, and instruction on the fire warning signals and firefighting procedures. We also go over health and safety aspects of the tasks to be assigned, including um, safe work procedures like uh, mandatory health and safety standards. Uh, we also do the go over the uh, miners' rights and their right to representation under the Act, a review and description of the line of authority for supervisors at the mine and how that what their responsibilities are. We talk about an introduction to your rules and procedures for reporting um, hazards. And so there's a great deal of things that we, we do talk about when we're uh, doing this training. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, I'm, I'm glad to go. I've, I've again been went to North Dakota to do this training and, and uh, it's been helpful for them and also for us to be able to share uh, with each other. No questions in the question box right now, but if you think of one, you can still add it and we'll ask it at the very end. Thank you, Shauna. And I will move things over now to Rich, who is going to present next. So Rich, whenever you're ready, there we go. Okay, we can see your PowerPoint and we can see you. Let me set it to show here. Okay, does uh, everybody see the slides, correct? Yes, we sure do. Okay, thank you. Um, so whenever I listen to LTAP folks speak, I always learn something. So those were two very interesting presentations and um, um, certainly I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm always I'm tremendously impressed with, with the different types of, of work that the LTAP community does and I'm always learning something. So thank you all for that. Um, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today, well, first, let me introduce myself. It, my name is Rich Tamakos. I'm the program manager here at Indiana LTAP. Um, and what I'd like to share with you guys today is um, a little bit of our response to current events and um, some of our action plan moving forward and a little bit about what we've learned and um, how we've responded to um, kind of the the situation at hand. Um, so so we start the year 2020. We we're very excited. We had what what we believe was one of our one of our more robust uh, training calendars um, in the years I've been with the program. We're very excited about it. Um, looking forward to to you know really really um, increasing our level of engagement and had some really exciting topics planned for this year. 
the the first part of the year is always our our, our most intense, I guess. Um, if you run into me at TRB in January and I have a worried look on my face, it's because that's the eleventh hour for three of our largest conferences, and I'm probably missing a speaker or two. So this year in February we had our stormwater conference. Uh, it was usually about three to four hundred people. We had our our NTEA uh, truck show, which is uh, ten thousand plus people, and our annual Purdue Road School, which was the second week of March, which is about three thousand. Uh, kind of the Indiana transportation industry um, event of the year. So big, big, big plans moving forward. Really excited. Um, and we had a a robust workshop series planned for. April and May, so so we were very very excited about what was what was coming up. We were geared up, and and, and I, I kind of used the analogy: we're moving at full speed. Our, our road school event ends ended on March 12th, which was a Thursday, and then the next day was Friday the 13th. And as we all know, um, that was kind of an interesting day for us here in Indiana. That was the day we were told to stop. Um, and within a week from that, the entire spring workshop series was canceled. Um, and, and it was, it was, you know, we were looking forward to a, a very robust training program, but even more so we had just, uh, uh, promoted, um, from within Meredith camp had been with the, the, has been with us since 2015 as our program coordinator. And she is just taking over as our training specialist. So, so she had had kind of a full program planned and ready to go, ready to take off running. And then we had an all stop. And so, what I want to talk about is now what, right? What do we do next? What is what does the next month look like? The next two months. So one of the things that I I always um, enjoy about the LTAP program, or very proud of about the LTAP program. I'm all over is that we are adaptive, responsive, and innovative, right? And I'm sharing a quote with you that I I used in an article we put together, but but really sat with me as to the the what next part, right? Um, and Lieutenant General Hal Moore, if anybody's familiar with who Lieutenant General Hal Moore is, if you saw the movie We Were Soldiers with Mel Gibson and the Battle of the I Train Valley, that was Lieutenant General Hal Moore. And um, one of the quotes he uses in one of his books is, you know, when you're faced with a difficult situation, you have to ask yourself that what, what am I doing that I should not be doing? And what am I not doing that I should be doing? And taking that philosophy forward, we looked at what should we stop doing? And, and what, we, what we stopped doing was our in-person workshops, our, our traveling, the university had us um, on a remote working situation. So um, we, we had to stop what was a traditional program and reassess, uh, uh, be responsive to the needs of our community. Our, our local agencies certainly had, um, you know, really looked, looked for our assistance in this situation. So we wanted to be responsive and we wanted to be innovative too. How do we stay connected with our audience, um, still provide training. Um, and and what it looked like was uh, we got in the business of webinars. And I've always been envious of our neighbors to the east in Ohio of the robust webinar program they have. And I always kind of told myself, we need to get into that. Well, in early April, we, we did. <laughs> so uh, we launched three webinars to date and we have about four or five more scheduled uh, we're going to try to get into a weekly um you know kind of ramp up so that we can offer these weekly um and we, we we cover the topics that we think are relevant to our folks um you know the the construction didn't stop maintenance activities didn't stop so the training shouldn't stop either um and one of the webinars we did that was really popular was kind of an update update on gas tax funding in indiana um, as people were under the stay home order, they weren't driving and our gas tax revenue um, took a significant hit. And we wanted to let our local agencies know what that was going to look like and when it was going to hit their account. So that was a very popular uh, webinar and, and well attended. The other thing we did, we had three Road Scholar, three of our 12 Road Scholar courses scheduled 
for the April, May timeframe. Um, we of course couldn't do those in person. So we um, have begun the process of turning them into full online courses. And in, in, in describing the online course, what we're, what we're looking at is kind of a lecture series, question and answers, um, somewhat of an asynchronous type learning environment for those. So we have the summer to complete those three online courses um, because the, the key date for us is one of the big projects that we, we took on um, immediately upon you know, you know, um, the, the current events and, and looking at our situation is we had, we had started a phase one of a new learning management system. We were modeling our LMS off of one that was developed for the Indiana High School Athletic Association. Um, we were kind of taking that, that what they had developed and modifying it to fit our audience. Um, we had done, uh, we had kind of broken into three phases. We had completed phase one last year where we were tracking attendees. Um, we had hoped to get phase two done by the end of 2020 and then the last phase by the end of 2021 as funding became available. Well upon um, um, needing to move to the online training um, rather quickly, we asked our, our advisory board for the funds to complete phase two and three as soon as possible. And they really stepped up. They showed a lot of support for our program and they gave us the funding to complete the second and third phase. And we hope to have that done by October. So as we develop our online Road Scholar courses and um, we're working also to develop some um, additional training, some new employee onboarding, some e-learning modules, and all of that will uh, build and, and, and reside within the LMS. We hope to have that completed um, by that October timeframe. We wish we had it now, but um, we certainly didn't want to wait two or three years, and, and our advisory board really really showed a lot of support for the program in, in providing that. So. We'll be able to develop courses, manage courses, have registration through it. Uh, we can do purchasing of courses through it, and we'll be able to, to, to fully track um, um, certificates and recertifications and all those things um, in an online environment. So it's a, it's a big step for us. Um, it was a big ask of our board, and, and they really, really stepped up for us to, to support the program. Um, and then a couple other things that that we thought we, you know, one of the things we learned pretty quickly is that um, under under the stay home order, communications became key in connecting with our local agencies, whether it's technical assistance training or just, you know, information gathering. So we did a couple things. Our quarterly print newsletter, um, we turned that into a monthly electronic version. Um, and and, and uh, Ashley Watson, our communication specialist, did an amazing job in not only putting out an electronic version, but but really diving in deep and 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 finding out what some of the you know some of the best formats for that, some of the best ways to connect to you know using our our deliver program, um, connecting people, and then also providing that information on our website. So it. We're really excited at what she's done to date, and um, we're going to continue this monthly thing uh, for the next few months to see where that goes. We're we're really happy with how that turned out. And then Ashley also established a COVID-19 resource uh, web page on our website, um, kind of gathering all the information that was out there on the web. And and really, we didn't we, we focused it not so much on. I mean, there's a lot of information on on what to do um, and, you know, keeping your social distancing and stuff. What we looked for was information on how to do maintenance activities, how to do construction. Um, some of the activities our local agencies are doing really kind of identified what some of those um, uh, best practices are and some of those resources are, as well as sharing, you know, there's been some great web uh, events um, relating to this that that have been with other LTAPs or are the construction industry and we've kind of shared that information on the website as well. And then our other activities, um, you know, trying to keep them um, active and running our research 
efforts. Um, we've kind of devoted some of our some of our research efforts to helping kind of address some of the concerns of our local agencies. Um, we've uh, Laura Slusher, our helpers engineer, has been very busy with road roadway safety activities. You know, kind of connecting with our communities and um, much of our asset management programs and and some of our other events are are kind of coming back online. We're a little uncertain what the fall looks like, and we're looking at some of our fall events becoming more virtual and and less uh, and less attended events. Um, trying to find out what the best fit is for that. So, um, just you know, it, for us, it's been a learning experience. I think there's been some opportunity in in connecting people to an online environment where they may have been hesitant before. Um, we're looking at, at, at doing it as well as we can. We're certainly learning as we're going. Um, so we've allowed ourselves to, 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 to try it, to fail at it, and then to learn to succeed at some of these things. So um, I, we encourage anybody, if you visit our website, there's some information on how to access our, our LMS to date, um, some of our other resources. Our website is purdue.edu. I N L T A P. That's all I got. I think I'm close to being on time. Thanks, Rich. And we don't have any questions currently in the question box for you. So I'm going to go ahead and move things over to Victoria Sage and make you the presenter. And while Victoria is loading that up, just as a reminder, if you have questions for either Victoria or any of the presenters so far today, please put them in the question box and we'll circle back around at the end of Victoria's presentation to get the answers for those. All yours, Victoria. Victoria, if you're talking, you have self-muted somewhere along the line. So we're not hearing you. I don't have you muted on my end. So if you've got a headphone set or something, that might be what did it. So while Victoria's figuring that part out, Paul. Am I coming through now? Oh yeah, we can hear you now. Yay. Okay. Okay, we can hear you. Thanks. I'm Victoria Sage, and I am the technical writer and training coordinator. Uh, Victoria, I'm sorry to bother you again. But it kind of sounds like you're in a tin can now. Can you maybe get a little closer to your microphone? Am I coming through now? I'm sorry. Much better. Thank you. Okay. So I'm Victoria Sage, and I am the technical writer and training coordinator at the Michigan LTAP. Almost overnight, the, the traditional office environment in Michigan changed to a digital binary stream. As we transitioned to a remote environment here, we realized that our workflow in our traditional offices and, remote, and road commission environments would be different. So we decided, rather quickly after the transition to offer a webinar on considerations and tools for effectively working in a remote environment. And I'm gonna to try to give you a snapshot of that webinar that we offered right now. In our tech saturated world, it's tempted to become romanced by tech technological tools. It's tempting to try to use those tools for technology's sake. We encourage participants to consider this fundamental question before selecting a tool for the job. What problem are we trying to solve? Without asking that crucial question, we can find ourselves trialing technology after technology for technology's sake. We highlighted some common problems that employees face when working in a remote environment. Then we looked at the theories behind potential solutions and discussed and demonstrated some of the tools available to address these problems. 
We looked at how, for some people, the work environment has merged with the home environment, which can create pitfalls for productivity. As we identified recommendations for overcoming those pitfalls, they included creating a designated workspace and keeping to a set schedule, which should also include breaks. Once the work environment has been established, we discussed the importance of choice in adopting technology in a remote work environment. Since you are the one that chooses technology rather than ch technology choosing you, it's essential to choose the right technology. The right technology is one that boosts productivity where you need it, that automates tasks to free up personal bandwidth, and that solves a specific remote work barrier that you're facing. In the end, too much unfiltered information can create choice overload and can sap us of the finite resources of time and, and attention. Since communication is an essential element in, in the workplace, we focused on, communication, on the communication bloat that can occur when one transitions into a remote workplace. So for example, there, se there seemed to be a never-ending uh, surge of group emails pertaining to COVID-19 updates, and all too often, people were just hitting delete before even assessing the importance of those emails. So to navigate communication tools, we started by discussing the importance of prioritizing or triaging the communication, and then discussing the importance of making communication matter. We explained how importance and urgency places communication in a do category, while lack of importance and lack of urgency places communication in a delete category. category. Since one cannot completely control what people are going to send us by email, we looked at built-in functionality in a number of different email programs for filtering. We looked at Gmail, Microsoft um, OneNote, and then um, Fi Firefox, I believe is what it was, Thunderbird, sorry. What we could have addressed in more depth was a need for establishing communication norms in creating clarity, predictability, and or uncertainty, and also individual norms, so whether or not a receiver prefers a certain response time, writing style, and tone. To facilitate, to facilitate not only work-related communication, but also the social aspects of work, we analyzed web meeting software. Web meeting technology can bring together small or large groups in a virtual face-to-face -face environment to look at problems and create solutions. These technologies let you talk using your internet or phone line and share real-time video feed, share one screen or slide deck, and chat using built-in messaging features. We also cautioned that too many web meeting invites can exacerbate that poverty of attention that we ended up talking about earlier. So too often, meeting coordinators have a temptation to invite everyone for fear of leave, leaving someone out. And when a web meeting is not relevant to somebody on the list and they attend, it saps their finite resources of time and attention. So before we... Before web meeting coordinators click invite, we ask them to ask their, themselves, does this person I'm inviting really need to be invited to the web meeting? We looked at video calls and how they can establish rapport and create empathy much better than emails or voicemails. What we could have addressed though, but didn't because we didn't have the time in that uh, webinar was how web meetings can also create a space for virtual team building rituals, giving people the opportunity to interact and the ability to experience their collaboration skills in action. And we do experience that at the uh, Michigan LTAP on a regular basis. We provided an overview of the various video conferencing tools, explaining the different capabilities that they have, ranging from group size limits, video and slide sharing capabilities, and different security levels. 
Although we didn't discuss it, web meeting tools are one of the best ways of reducing distance when it comes to things like value, trust, and interdependency. Finding a time to meet or chat can also be challenging in a remote work environment. While it's easy to drop into an office and say, hey, do you have the time, time to talk? Or is Pete in the office today? Remote work environments don't give us that luxury. So during the webinar, we looked at calendars and scheduling polls as a way to get everyone together at the same time without a chain email or everyone's plans changing. We also discussed navigating projects and project tasks using a project ticketing system. These systems, they help triage project assignments if people at an agency regularly assign projects to different staff members. What these tools do is they allow you to post a project description, assign projects to specific team members, as well as creating subtasks on those assignments. They're also a great way to document a project and the steps that were taken to complete that project. While useful, we strongly underscored the fact that they should not replace more personal forms of communication. For those who may be working on projects where draft upon draft upon draft might get lost in an email shuffle, we looked at collaboration tools as a way to triage the drafting process. Collaborative editing tools like Google Doc or Microsoft Cloud allow both real-time and asynchronous collaboration on a single document. And for sharing files back and forth, we overviewed cloud-based services like Google Drive, Dropbox, and Microsoft OneDrive. Cloud-based shared workspaces allow collaborators to store and edit documents, even large documents, without clogging the email line. Finally, another big consideration for local agencies was getting documents signed. So we did spend a few minutes looking at virtual signing tools that are, that were, that are available for them to use. We also provided them a handout of a number of resources. This is a sampling of some of the resources that we provided during our webinar. And with that, I will turn it over and see if anybody has any questions. Questions that have come in for you. Beverly would like to know, can you share the results from your web meeting tools? Okay, um, can I get a little bit more clarification of what is meant by the results of the web meeting tools? I'm gonna go over and unmute Beverly so she can just ask you that question directly. So. Okay. Beverly, I've unmuted you on my end, so are you there? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, you said you did a um, study of the different web web meeting tools, I guess like GoToWebinar, Zoom, um, the various tools that people can use to conduct webinars. So I was wondering if you can share the information, you know, which ones you thought were good, which ones you thought were just not good. Yeah, so when we discussed that, we didn't really evaluate it based on good versus not good, but we pretty much went down a list of some of the more common ones. So um, I'll cycle back up to that slide if you don't mind. Um, so we looked at Adobe Connect, uh, Skype uh, Meet Now, um, Uber Meet, and what else did we have? I can't remember what these ones are. Um, and then we just, uh, we had um, Zoom, and I can't remember what the, the last one is. And we pretty much just evaluated them ba based on what features they had and whether or not they had free options available. So for example, with um, Skype Meet Now, you could uh, have free meetings and you don't need an account, you don't need to download anything, um, but you're limited to 20 or 25 people in a meeting. Uh, Zoom and um, go to meeting, I believe have HIPAA compliant levels of security. So if that's the type of thing you need, uh, we discussed that you can get 
much higher levels of security on different platforms that are out there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, could you share that by chance? So I'm just curious to see which one, what tools offer. I guess I know some of them are free, no, I'm free, but the security. Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure if I'm able to like uh, distribute something after this meeting, like send a, because I can probably extract yes. those slides from the original presentation if that would work. Yep, I've got the Excel spreadsheet that I can download and send to you with everybody's email addresses. Um, okay. Or you can even, you know, send it out on the NLTAPA Google Groups listserv, because I'm sure more people would be interested in that information as well. Sure. Okay, the, we did have a, no other questions right now for you, Victoria, but we had a question for Paul. And Paul, the question came from Mary Lee over in New Hampshire. She wanted to know, are others outside of Iowa, like New Hampshire, able to sign up and access the resources you discussed? Um, I actually thought about that because the, the only problem with that, Mary Lee, and for any of our LTAPs is that there is a cost. And I don't know if Iowa LTAP can foot the bill for the country because other than that, I mean, I would be glad to. Um, so, but what I can do is that each one of those safety training modules is in a separate folder, so to speak. I mean, I just have one big folder with safety resources and then each one of those modules has all of those PDFs and all of that information that's already broken down. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, be glad to share that with anybody. And then all you'd have to do is put together your website or if we can overcome the challenge of funding the videos, then I certainly don't mind doing that either. That sounds great, Paul. There's always the Basecamp um, application where you could upload everything to. Mm -hmm. So, and Mary Lee said thanks. Great. Right. Is there anybody Victoria, else? Victoria, this is Kim. Um, and I just wanted to add, I had checked out um, when Paul mentioned that Safety Soft was now the um, the the video provider and it looks like they also have an option where you can start a free trial and and take a tour so that might be an option as well if, if people are wanting to check out some of the videos um, I don't know Paul if that's something you would recommend yeah you can go on uh, there's no there's no cost at all to preview those videos uh, what I've found and I've warned some of our counties is kind of the first time that you go on there if it doesn't recognize your IP address, then they'll just want to know who you are, you know, uh, who's in their site. And then you can you can preview any of those videos that you want. Um, and like I said, they're, they're a good company. We've never had any problems with them at all. And I encourage our counties to get on there, kick the tires and do whatever they want to do. So, yep, it's fine. Okay, there's no other questions in the question box right now, but if someone would like to ask an audio question, you can either put in the question box that you'd like to be unmuted, or you could just try raising your hand on the GoToWebinar attendee panel. But Kim, is there anything else you'd like to add as we get close to the end of this session, or Paul? No, I was just going to say I, I left my video up and my mic on, but I just wanted to thank um, Shauna and Victoria up in Michigan and Rich for agreeing to do this. Um, I was kind of surprised I had contacted a few LTAPs and they just told me no. And um, so <laughs> it turned out to be a little harder job than I thought, but uh, but I really appreciate those guys stepping up and, and did a great job. I appreciate all of them. Thank you. Yeah, I would just echo that. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I think is really great about this group is, is how we share, you know, information. And um, I think the information that was shared today, you know, is there's something we can take from each of those presentations. And I, I know we're also kind of looking at in West Virginia, you know, we, we have the availability to use Zoom meeting. Um, the university is paying for that license. If we want to use Zoom webinar, there's, there's limited licenses. So I know even just for us, just comparing those two versions of, of the same uh, web, web, web based training is something we've kind of um, been questioning and struggling with. Um, I would like to add that our next LTAP Lunch and Learn for next month, we're gonna focus on newer folks to LTAP. And so some of the things that we would typically do during um, LTAP U 
Um, so just be on the lookout for that. And, you know, again, if you have any questions for any of the presenters, please feel free to, you know, raise your hand or type them in. Everybody must be moving into their after lunch lull right now. <laughs> or we, we've overwhelmed them with so much good information. They're just sorting through it. So and this will be this is recorded, right? Um, Victoria, yes, it'll be it is available. OK, yeah, I hope to get it uploaded later today. So all right, there's kudos rolling in for the presenters. There's lots of thank yous in the question box. So I want to thank everybody for being on here. And we'll go ahead and wrap things up now. And everyone, please stay safe. And we hope to see you back on another call or work group meeting soon. Thanks, Victoria. Thank you. Take care, everybody.